Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing series about Pensacola, North America's first place city. And in this series, we are dealing with the story of Pensacola and its railroads. And last time, we had taken our story just about up to the beginning of the 20th century, where the Ellen and Railroad, or the Pensacola and Atlantic, had completed its route across uh, northwest Florida, across the Panhandle. Uh, the Pensacola, Alabama, and Tennessee Railroad was in the making, step by step, moving north toward Memphis. Uh, the the uh, Pensacola, New Orleans, and uh, Pensacola Mobile in New Orleans had about 40 miles of track across uh, southern Alabama. The Pen Pensacola and Perdido was moving from Millview down to the docks here in Pensacola. Uh, we were becoming a, a railroad city. And uh, the many of the people, particularly the L&N uh, employees, lived in the little village of Bohemia, just to the on the east side along the bay. And they, they had their own little village. Now, there's one story that uh, I, I love to tell about it because it's so unique. Uh, the the village itself was was ice was somewhat isolated. They had their own store. They had the, they had their own telegraph unit there, of course, because of the railroad uh, communication. But they they made arrangements for all their people. And one arrangement they had was with for, with one of the local physicians. And this, this physician uh, uh, was on contract. And of course, he lived in Pensacola, ser served at, the, uh, at that point at the St. Anthony's Hospital. And to, when they had a, a need for his services in some sort of emergency, they would use the telegraph, a messenger would get the doctor, and he would be taken down to the depot down on, on Wright Street. And they had a special hand car right there for him. And they would put the hand car on the rack track, give him one other employee to help pump it, and they would go back up and down uh, using the, the, the hand handles on the on the on the hand car and get as far as the village where another group of people would meet them take the car off put it on a siding and the doctor would go up do his job and then be taken back into town i don't know of any other place in the in the country that had a story quite like that and of course as all this is going on and we, we need to mention just a little bit about what these people did and and how they signaled now we have to remember that railroading began Back in the 18, about 1830, it's as good as years any to, to, to tack on for the, across the country. When rail, the railroading began, there was no telegraph, certainly no telephone, and so signaling back and forth to one another, and even between the members of the crew of a given train, was very difficult. So train men, and this of course is the engineers, the main, and the conductor, and the brakeman, all developed their own sort of signal code. Now people, even today. Uh, whether you hear, hear an old, if you happen to be taking a, a, a journey on an old-fashioned uh, steam locomotive with its unusual whistle, or listen to in, as a train, uh, a diesel locomotive passes through the uh, the city, then you'll hear the you may, may hear the whistle blow, you hear a, a signal. But people don't realize that what they blow is a signal, and many times you will have heard something like this. <laughs> That signal, two shorts and two longs, basically that's the signal that a train is coming, get off the track. And you, there are all manner of different signals, sometimes a signal one, for example like this. That's the signal of the, of the engineer telling the, uh, the conductor and all those behind him on the train that he's ready to go when they are. And then of course the conductor would get off, he would either have a flag or in some, in the later versions, he would have a pull rope that might be used. He would have a flag, or at night, of course, he would use a lantern. And they would use the lantern or the flag to signal, yes, I've heard the signal, it's okay to proceed, and away they would go. And then the engineer, having heard that, he would go, <coughs> and that's it, all is well, and away we go. So when you hear those different whistle toots along the way, every one of them has a different meaning, and that's part of a signal system that began to exist way back in the 1830s and 40s. So we, we haven't changed much on that at all. Well, as we moved into the, into the early part of the 20th century, railroading was just absolutely exploding everywhere. Every, the, the community, every, every community felt that they would be better off economically if they had more routes going to different places. And so people began to charter additional railroads. Now, why they went to this degree, I frankly do not know. But the, the records of the Pensacola City Council show us that between 1900 and 1906, six more railroads were, I'm going to read off some of the names for you. I, I can't remember all of these, but, but we, the Gulf of Mexico Railroad, the Pensacola, Alabama and Western, the Pensacola Northern, the Pensacola and Western, the Pensacola and uh, Alabama and Tennessee, all of these were, all of these were chartered 
within the period 1900 and 1960. Each of the, the, the organizations put up a $15,000 bond and they were prepared to go ahead once they had all of their financing in place. And in each case, the city council had given their permission. Now visualize, as you, if you can, how this might have worked. Each one of those rail lines would have climaxed along, uh, to the, uh, along Pensacola Bay, and these railroad companies would have purchased land from the city of Pensacola and built their own dock out into Pensacola Bay, and then their trackage would have started west along Main Street. Now, at that point in time, we had already had uh, two railroads moving in that direction, and we had already built the, the dummy line, which was simply a passenger line out to the Navy. Basically, all those were already in place, and one can only imagine how congested this might have been if you tried to put additional trackage along Main Street. Uh, fortunately for all of us, or for all of them, not one of those railroads ever matured, never, never came into being. But nonetheless, the plan was there. Okay, we move into the into the uh, middle, or the early years of the 20th century, and by the time we get to the to the to the war years, we begin to see some some things happening. The, the Pensacola, Alabama, and Tennessee had been sold to another line. It was now having trouble because they had, while they had reached the coal fields in Alabama, they had never succeeded in going beyond that, moving toward uh, much farther toward Memphis. And by the time we get to 1919, they had a, a terrible accident that almost put them out of business. And it's hard to you know. It, to these, these days, it's hard to understand how that might have been, but in 1919, <clears throat> With a, they had a, a large amount of cargo stored on on the uh, on their docks down at the foot of C Street, and in come, came a vessel, a large mer uh, commercial vessel called the John Adams, and it was a very windy, blustery night, and either the pilot miscued or something, but the John Adams smashed into the docks of the railroad and all but destroyed them. And of course, the insurance coverage was nowhere near enough to cover this, and there was a question at that time whether this railroad would actually continue, and it was in very shaky financial condition for a number of years, for a couple of years anyway. And then a number of local businessmen stepped in and they bought the railroad and gave it a new name, the Pensacola Muscle Shoals and, no, Pensacola Birmingham and Muscle Shoals Railroad. This was a, basically the same place and they were literally trying to make that railroad survive. And so they, they began uh, making small improvements, but then they began negotiating. And they got, the idea of negotiation was, please, if we can just find some other larger railroad that would connect with us coming out of the north or northwest so that we would have that route that we've all dreamed about that would take us to Texas, to, Be to Memphis, to St. Louis, and so on. Well, finally, in the, in the month of uh, July of 1926, that agreement was made with the St. Louis and San Francisco, or the Frisco Railroad. And the Frisco agreed that they would build a linkage between what was there from the, from the uh, Muscle Shoals Birmingham Railroad up to a point in, in uh, Mississippi, but a trackage distance of about 142 miles. And the Frisco be began this construction. And in June of 18, uh, 1928, it was completed. And you kind of have to go back and just visualize what a, what a wonderful night that must have been. Because that evening, uh, June the 28th, two full passenger trains came chugging down this new trackage into Pensacola and all the way down to what we one, at one time called the Frisco Dock at the foot of Spring Street. It, this, these trains were just loaded with dignitaries from St. Louis, from places up the, up the trackage. And of course, a number of Pensacola people had gone north to get on the train and come in. The mayor was there, the county commission, everyone was there. Great celebration. Everyone just visualized that we finally had arrived. We now not only had trackage that took us on the LNN and to the to Flomet and then to the northeast, on the, on the LNN across the Panhandle to the east, and now we were going to be able to go north and northwest. Everything was in order. And for about one year, that's the way things were. But then came the Great Depression. And the Great Depression hit all of the railroads. It, just as it hit industry and had commerce of all kinds, the railroad shrunk. And for Pensacola's purposes, it was a very tragic time because in the Depression, the, the maintenance done on the railroads was minimal. Uh, the number of people were employed were decreased. And so things went on in a, in a rather unfortunate way. And basically, that's, that's, uh, that's the way things proceeded until we get into the 1960s and 70s. Actually, by the time we, I should, should stop there, in, in, in the latter portion, of the 1950s. Both railroad, the l &N and the Frisco, had reached the point where they did not have faith that Pensacola as a port city was going to boom or blossom further. And so in, in May and June of 1957, the two railroads literally gave their local 
dockage and warehouses to the Pensacola Port Authority. The, the L&N was first, the Frisco came second, and the l and was an outright gift. All of the, all the trackers, the little railroad yard, the, the uh, warehouses, all was a gift to the, to the Port Authority. The Frisco's was a gift too, except it had a caveat, that if that, if that facility, at the, that port facility, was not used for port purposes for a period of three years, then the Frisco had the right to take it back. Well, uh, as many Pensacola people know, the L&N docks tra tragically burned in uh, 1958, and that began the period in which the Pensacola Port Authority began the rebuilding of our port, of the Pensacola Port, as we see it in the year 2009 and beyond. The Frisco docks, unfortunately, they burned too, but that was seven years later. Once again, we don't know how the fire began, but the docks burned. And by that time, of course, this, the Port Authority was so busy working with the rebuilding of the L&N facility, they didn't have the wherewithal of uh, rebuilding the, the Frisco, and it stood idle a year, two years, three years, almost to the deadline, the city of Pensacola agreed that they would take over the Port Authority. They dismembered the Port Authority and the city took it over. And unfortunately, for economic history at least, they, they disregarded the three-year caveat. And so the Frisco Railroad ultimately came and reclaimed what they had given to the Port Authority in 1957. That pr same property ultimately became a sort of, a, of an economic and cultural football. It became known as the Trillium property and ultimately it had been set aside hopefully for a maritime park. But that, that is how the land developed, evolved in, the, in a structure. And of course, it ceased to be a port, a railroad port facility in 19. 1966. Well, the Frisco ultimately merged. It, it merged with the, the much larger Burlington Northern Railroad in 1979. So that we, again, Pensacola people said, well, even though the, 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 what we have here is very limited, we don't have a real dock anymore, we still have the opportunity to ship that way. But the, the trackage and so forth was, became a, a boon of contention downtown. People, uh, many people in the, in the commercial district objected to uh, having delays along the waterfront when, tra when tracks, uh, trains moved back and forth between the, the little Frisco Yard or Burlington Northern Yard and the l &N. And so ultimately the complaints went to the city council and they said, well, we can't have that. So they literally tore up the tracks which connected the two. And that gave a signal to the Burlington Northern that they, they really, that this was, uh, they just didn't want to, uh, to continue anymore. So they sold out to a small railroad, the Alabama Gulf Coast Railroad. It's a small uh, inter-area air, uh, railroad which continues to serve down there. They have a small rail yard just off of O Street and they they still continue to serve the area, but it has nowhere the connection that the Burlington Northern did before. So basically, that's our story as we come into the 21st century. We've had all of these things develop. We still have the wonderful service that is provided here by the, by the CSX, which was the successor to the l and uh, The Pensacola and Perdido is long gone. The Pensacola M Mobile in New Orleans, it's long gone. Uh, Unfortunately, we no longer have the full connection that took us into Memphis and, and uh, Texas directly. And passenger service, which was su once a, such a, an important part of our story, well, of course, it, it evaporated. It, it gradually faded away with the m many people having more motor cars, with the uh, uh, coming of the interstate highway system, and then, of course, with air travel. So uh, uh, over the years, first of all, the Frisco and then the, uh, the L&N both abandoned their uh, passenger services. Their passenger uh, stations were shut down uh, for a brief period, the uh, we Pensacola in the area had the services of the Amtrak a railroad system operated by the federal government. But after the, the hurricanes of recent times, that has been shut down as well. We still have a fine Amtrak railroad station at 14th Avenue, but it is largely standing idle. So basically, we still have the railroad, it's still providing service. But the, the, the one moral to our story of Pensacola and the railroads, I believe, is this, that we it, the railroads and Pensacola grew together. Railroads were so important in the development of our economic history and it's unfortunate we have not been able to maintain them in the same level that we had before but then who knows what will happen in the future perhaps interurban traffic whatever it may come again and that's part of not today but tomorrow's story